the, the psychologist would probably say the reason I became an entrepreneur is that it's in my uh, upbringing. My, my father, um, my earliest memories are him having a job and, and commuting out to an office. But then, very early on in my in my kind of memory of my childhood, him uh, starting his own business and uh, actually working from home. So not unlike we all are in a pandemic. Um, and so I remember as a um, you know, before I was even ten, I was helping with things like. Uh, stuffing envelopes, you know, the, the email marketing before email and uh, and that kind of thing. And then I think the other side of it is really getting interested in technology and wanting to build things. Our rebranding process from, uh, as we spun out the, what we used to call the optimization delivery network from Distilled, we spun it out into an independent company called Search Pilot. And uh, that was in the midst of, of quite a lot of chaos because we also um, were in the midst of a transaction to uh, the rest of Distilled, the consulting and, and commerces businesses were, were acquired in the process. So there was a lot going on. And then of course we ran into a global pandemic. So I don't know if I would necessarily suggest that everybody does it the way uh, the way we did, uh, which has had a little bit of chaos in there. But I think my biggest tip, especially in small businesses doing this, is to have fun with it. Some of the stuff that we have um, uh, got the most out of has been just enjoying building the new brand, building the um, thinking about what we wanted to have different, uh, thinking about what we wanted to keep the same, and drilling down into things that underpin the obviously things like the visual brand, into things like uh, the, the the values and the culture of, of the company that we're that we're creating, and trying to think about how that is going to pervade everything we do. The, the biggest challenge that I think we've we've kind of faced head on is trying to diversify our speaker lineup um, and find really the absolute best speakers we can, no matter what their background, where they come from, um, you know, uh, all those uh, kind of other diversity attributes. And the the challenge we faced there was that if you just put out a call for speakers, you inevitably just get uh, people like me, overconfident middle-aged white guys, and um, we really wanted to, to, to pull them away from that. And so we, we had to get quite proactive with it, in, including not only just the outreach side, but also developing speakers. So we put a lot of effort into uh, new, developing new speakers, bringing people up who, who had maybe only presented in smaller environments, uh, coaching them, giving them the tools, training them, and helping them get onto the big stage. You know, I, I'm a big fan of trying to um, uh, solve the kind of development, learning, knowledge share, uh, idea generation challenge in lots of different ways. And I think there's a place for pure online things. But I also don't think that's going to, in the long run, replace in person. And so, uh, yeah, you know, we just, we have to buy that time. But uh, but when the time is right, Search Lab will be back as an in-person event. SEO split testing is one of the core uh, benefits of the search pilot platform and it's something that we've kind of tried to pioneer in bringing to, uh, to to the wider market it's similar to the idea that many people are probably familiar with in terms of testing uh, com for conversion rate optimization or user experience reasons but there's a couple of key differences that mean that you can't test through the CRO platforms when you're looking for Google benefits so what we do is instead of splitting the audience which is the way that a conversion rate test works we split the website and so we take some pages and keep them unchanged and make the change to other pages and then apply some kind of uh, you know, pretty advanced mathematical statistical techniques to figure out whether those uh, changes are statistically significant and whether we're statistically confident that there's been uh, an uplift. I think probably the thing that we come across most is this idea that there are um, fixed truths that apply to every website or every situation. For the most part, it's a myth that many of those things exist. What we find when we test is it's very situational. So it depends on the industry, on the website, on the individual pages. I think there's space in SEO for many, many different backgrounds. Some of the most talented uh, marketers and SEOs that I've worked with have ranged from yeah, advanced degrees in science and technology type subjects, mathematics, through to you know, didn't go to university at all uh, and uh, have backgrounds in all kinds of other areas. So I, I definitely don't think it's it's required or, or, or necessary in any way. I think there is a space in 
a team to have some people with that kind of background because I think um, you know, deep understanding of the technology, some SEO challenges are deeply technical and, and you kind of need, you need at least the experience, but you don't necessarily need a university qualification in, in those areas. I feel pretty strongly about that. Uh, and I feel safe saying it as somebody who has one. I definitely would approach the idea of establishing expertise, authority and trustworthiness as kind of a face value, like actually develop expertise, authority and trustworthiness rather than trying to uh, prove to Google that that you have those things. And so I've been a big fan you know, in, in my businesses of really doubling down on, on the expertise side. I, I think it's been great for uh, people's morale and, and, and people's enjoyment of working at a company to know that they can really develop mastery in their chosen subject. If you have uh, category pages, which you know, most decent sized e-commerce sites obviously will, then experiment with uh, putting structured markup lists of products on your category pages. So it's quite common to use structured data on the, cat on the product pages themselves, but you can actually mark up category pages with a list of structured data as well and say, this page contains you know, this list of products. And uh, that's not gonna help you rank better, but it can help you get rich, um, richer snippets in the search results, and it can help get a better click-through rate in the search results and therefore get more organic search traffic. So on the one hand, I don't worry about it too much in the sense that Incremental clicks are free. So one of the great things about organic search is that you you know you do the work and you get the traffic you want as well as ranking better for things that you don't care about. And that's okay. It's okay to get irrelevant organic traffic in a way that it's probably not okay to pay for irrelevant paid search traffic. So I don't I don't stress about it in the sense of like, oh, we're ranking for these things that aren't perfect for us. I need to do something about that. It's more like, okay, let's focus on the areas that are good for us. And, and in those areas, what we're doing, again, on the testing side is a concept of full funnel testing, which is the idea of testing, simultaneously testing a change to see whether it is good for conversion rate and separately to see whether it's good for organic traffic and, and SEO. Having been around the industry for 15 years plus now, I'm always surprised by how little things change or, or how slowly in many ways. Like the, some of the tactics change and yes, new features will be released or new things that you have to think about. But a lot of the fundamentals to make sure your content can get crawled, indexed, make sure that it's targeting user demand, make sure that your website is authoritative. Those have been unchanged for a decade plus. So the fundamentals aren't gonna be different in 2021. What I think is changing is Google increasingly moving to their machine learning driven approach, which means that, uh, as I said in, uh, in previous answers, the, the best practices go away. The, the, there is no unified right answer that will be good for every website in every situation. And hence why we are all in on testing. For our own business, our best growth channel is probably email. That's the thing that we're, um, we're most putting most effort into growing. Though I always feel weird calling email a channel because of course it is as a last touch. How do people get on your list? Well, uh, they don't get on there from email marketing, quite obviously. So I think going a level beyond that, I mean, fundamentally, a lot of it is about search. You know, we, we, we do some work on social, but we're trying to create content on our website that will be evergreen, that will, will continue bringing us organic traffic for uh, years to come. The third party tool I find hardest to operate without is any kind of crawling technology. If I was going to give um, two specific examples, it would be getting started. I would use Screaming Frog, cheap and effective. Uh, and at scale, we've we've bought DeepCrawl um, as the crowd uh, cloud crawling platform. And so, uh, yeah, I think I think if I could only have one, uh, it would probably be some kind of crawling technology. people I've tried to look up to are people with the grit and determination to um, make their own path. And that's what I've tried to take into uh, my own life to think, okay, well, I can take advantage of, of the, the areas I've been lucky. And then how can I make my own luck in, um, in the areas I need to? 
the the single book I recommend most often is Patrick Lencioni's Five Dysfunctions of a Team, which changed my business life. Uh, to, to to be honest, it was recommended to me too late. I, I wish I'd read it sooner. It's written for CEOs, but it's I think it's valuable to every every level of contributor in every team. And the the core concepts and a lot of the language in there has made its way into our leadership team meetings over the years. I think the best advice I ever received is not to compare your inside to other people's outside. In other words, not to compare how you feel with how it looks like other people feel, because you can never really tell. And you, you know, you, you'll think you're a mess of insecurity and um, uncertainty and doubt, and other people are confident and have it together, and they're thinking the exact same thing the other way around.